As the Buddha said, suffering is the clinging aggregates. The aggregates themselves are related to the way we feed, and clinging, of course, is related to the way we feed. The word for clinging, upadana, can also mean sustenance and uh, the act of taking sustenance off of things. Of course, we don't think of feeding as suffering. For most of us, that's how we get our pleasure in life. So that's how we keep going as beings. We take lots of pleasure in thinking about it and planning for feed, feeding and then in the actual feeding itself. So this is where the Buddhist teachings go against the grain. But our suffering is strong. So it needs something that goes very strongly against the grain, our attachment to our suffering. As a John Sawat liked to use to say, it's our likes that make us suffer. And food is one of the big likes in life. And the act of feeding is one of the big likes in life, too. And so we need pretty strong medicine to counteract that. And when you look at the types of clinging, they're very closely related to the way we feed. Sensuality clinging has to do with our fascination with thinking about the food we're going to take what we're going to have tomorrow, how we're going to fix it, how good it's going to taste. We can think about that for long periods of time, much longer than the actual amount of time you spend eating the food. Then there's clinging to habits and practices, like the way we feed, the kinds of things we will do in order to get food, and our ideas of what's a legitimate way of looking for food and which ones are not. And then once you've got the food, how you fix it. And we tend to identify ourselves very strongly with this. People who are vegan, people who are gluten-free, people who won't take soy, people who eat nothing but soy. The list is very long. It just keeps getting longer and longer, it seems. And how the food has to be fixed. Then there are views views about the world out there, what counts as food, what doesn't count as food, what foods are worthwhile, which ones are not. This morning I was mentioning to a group of visitors the, the fact that I'm on statins right now, and there's a long, long series of lectures on it, back and forth about whether they were good or bad. The same goes for lots of different kinds of foods. And then there's finally your sense of yourself as the person who's being fed by all this, who you are, what kind of person looks for food in a certain way, what kind of person eats certain kinds of food, what kind of person is going to be benefiting from the food, what kind of person you're going to become as a result of eating a certain way. We're all very much attached to these things. You see this particularly in our, in our obsessions, our addictive behavior. Because we feed not only on food, but also on types of behavior and ideas and on our, our relationships with other people. And some of them get to be pretty addictive and obsessive when we know they're unhealthy, but we keep going back for them. So you have to analyze them in these terms. See that this is the strength of the addiction is that lies in these different kinds of clinging, your fascination with thinking about how good it's going to be, the pleasure you're going to get out of that particular kind of thinking or addiction. And even when there's a large part of the mind that realizes it's bad for you, there's another part that really goes for it. And it's thoroughly convinced it's a good thing. You have to ferret that out, and you have to argue with it. And there's habits and practices, and we tend to be very quick to fall into old habitual ways of behaving. And because we've practice them so often and follow through with them so often, it seems like they're almost effortless. And any other way of looking for pleasure goes very strongly against the grain. Our views about what types of pleasure there are out there, our views about how responsible we are for what's going to happen down the line, this is a big one. Because the addictive mindset, the obsessive mindset, just says, well, I'm going to go for my pleasure right now, and who cares about the future, because the future is uncertain. But this hit, or this 
type of behavior, that seems to be pretty certain. That too is a kind of view, and your sense of who you are. When you start identifying with that addictive part of your personality, that becomes your identity. And you find it harder and harder to think about other ways of doing things. You tend to think that you're incapable of doing them, or that you try for a while and then you give up and say, that's proof that you can't do it, that you can't get away from the old kind of behavior. So we need strong medicine to counteract this, and this is what the Eightfold Noble Path is for. It's meant to attack these different kinds of clinging. In thinking of sensuality, you have to replace that with right resolve and with the desire and right effort. You have to learn how to motivate yourself to, to say, well, there must be something better in life. And you think about how much better it would be if you didn't give in to that particular kind of behavior. Resolve for renunciation, for harmlessness. You don't want to harm yourself. You don't want to have ill will for yourself, because many times there's that aspect to an addiction. Then you want to think about how good it's going to be to be free. Those two factors help to replace the clinging to sensuality. As for habits and practices, well, we take on new habits, the habits of right action, right speech, right livelihood. We take the precepts and we find that we can actually f follow through with them, and that life really does get better this way. You're creating fewer and fewer problems for yourself. And there's the practice of concentration. The practice of, this is right mindfulness and right concentration. You find that there are these alternative forms of pleasure that you can tap into. Of course, with views, we replace them with right views. So the important issue in life is not the pleasure that you're sucking out of life, but the things you're doing and the consequences you're going to have down the line. You have to take that very seriously. Because the pleasures you got, uh, John, you got a John Suat like to say, those sensual pleasures you had last week, where are they now? They're totally gone. But you are left with a karma. If you believe in karma, just look at the habits you've developed. You get into these old ruts, these old ways of thinking, these old ways of behaving. And the more you indulge them, then the harder they are to get out of. Because that's what you're left with, the habit. You're left with that action. So you have to see this very clearly and realize that it is causing a lot of suffering. And this is something we tend to turn a blind eye to, both the suffering we cause ourselves and the suffering we cause to others. It's very easy to say, well, it doesn't matter, or it's unavoidable, or it's a part of embracing all of life. That's a big one. Recently I was reading somebody saying about how Life is wonderful, and therefore we have to see everything in life as wonderful, including aging, illness, and death, and all the horrible things that people do to one another. And what is that if not blindness? You have to take seriously the fact that our actions are leading to suffering. And suffering, a lot of the suffering is pointless. Nothing gets accomplished. So we have to replace our views about the, the addictive thinking with right views, starting with mundane right view about karma and then right view about suffering and its causes as feeding on this kind of behavior. That's suffering right there. You've got to see it. And so there you have all the factors of the path. Then as for doctrines of the self, that also is related to right view, but it's also related to your sense of is who you are in relationship to all those other things, in relationship to the kinds of pleasures you like to think about, the skills you have. For most of us, addictive behavior comes from just a lack of alternative skills. And so we practice the alternative skills, and you become the kind of person who has those skills. As a John Lee would often say, don't be too quick to go for inconstancy, stress, and not-self, and especially the not-self part. He says you want to develop concentration so that you can have a sense of constancy in your mind, something that you can hold on to. 
something that's pleasant, something that you have under your control. And there's going to be a sense of self you build around that, and that becomes the new sense of self that finds it easier and easier to resist your old addictive thinking, your addictive behavior. So you take the path and you use it to counteract all your forms of clinging. It's important to see that these teachings on clinging are not very abstract. They're very closely related to the way we feed off of things. And the path is there to give us an alternative way of feeding, a way that instead of sapping our strength, actually builds our strength. It gets the mind more and more sensitive to what real happiness is. Because it all comes down to this desire for happiness. Someone was saying today that they had trouble seeing that they deserved happiness. But the Buddha never talks about deserving happiness or not deserving happiness. He's here put it, to put it into suffering, whether it's deserved or not. We can think about lots of different ways where we might deserve to suffer or other people might deserve to suffer. But that's part of our views that are making us continue to suffer unnecessarily. The opportunity to stop making yourself suffer is here and, and, and not placing this burden of suffering on yourself. You're putting less of a burden on other people, and you're actually more able to help them. So learn to straighten out your views around this whole issue of feeding. Straighten out your fascination with thinking about sensuality. Start thinking about the topics of right resolve and right effort. There's desire there in the effort. In fact, it's an important part. You have to learn how to want to do it. And so learn how to talk yourself into doing this. The mind, the part of the mind that doesn't like to meditate will put up arguments, but you've got to have your arguments to go against them. So you're not just going through the motions, that you're actually really looking into your breath right now, looking into your mind as it relates to the breath, so you can understand it. Figure out this mind that's so obstreperous. You think it's you, you think it's yours, but there's so much in it that's going against your best interests. Learn how to be fascinated with trying to figure that out. Pick up the habits of the precepts, the practice of mindfulness and concentration. Straighten out your views about what's important in life and what's possible in life. And you will become a different person. And that different person will help carry you through not only getting over the addictive behavior, but also learning how to master the skills so it goes, they go higher and higher. Because there really is this potential within us for something deathless. And why are we dithering around? or things that we know are harmful for ourselves. The deathless is there, it's attainable. When you can develop the sense of self that says, okay, I can do this. I want to do this. I'm learning the skills. And it's possible. Okay, that sense of self will actually take you to the point where you don't need it anymore. And when you let go of it, it's not letting go of it because you're disgusted with it or angry at it, which is how we tend to let go of certain members of our self-committee. It's a raft. You leave it, but you leave it with a sense of appreciation. It's something that you cling to as you get across the river, and then you can let it go. You're standing on firm ground, as the Buddha said. To use the path to get, get over all these forms of clinging. And even though you may not be on the firm ground of total awakening, you, you find that things are a lot more solid, a lot more reliable, as you've got the path to hold on to. You become more solid and more reliable, too. A better person to live with. both for yourself and for the people around you.